Okay, so yes, how did you two meet? Well, um, I, I was um, in college in New York City and in walks in Youssef Salam of what was formerly known as the Central Park Five. And because our professor was sort of an activist in the community, she was part of SNCC, the civil rights movement, um, a movement called, uh, organization called Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And I believe she was part of the Black Panther Party. Uh, so she was a very active member in our community. And from what I recently learned, Youssef was looking to sit in on her class and in he walks. And because I was the, an editor of my college's newspaper, when uh, we remembered who he was, I wanted to get his story. I wanted to interview him immediately. Yeah. But as we're learning, he wasn't ready to share his story because he had just been released um, two years prior and was served, uh, on probation um, for a crime that he did not commit. And I was just an eager journalist ready to get his story out to my college community. Mm -hmm. And when we ended up talking for a long time, but we lost contact over the years because a lot changed for him. And we ran into each other again a few years ago while I was promoting my one of my first books. And he shared that he wanted to communicate, um, be in conversation more with young people. Mm -hmm. And this was before the When They See Us series. And then the rest is history. The rest is history. Then we created an amazing book. Yes. Hey, Absolutely. You two did that. Absolutely. Uh, Yusuf, your brand new book together called Punching the Air. Tell us a little bit about the book. So Punching the Air is really the story of, um, of being Black in America. It's the story of slavery continuing, especially in America, by another name through the um, criminal justice system. You know, the fact that you look at the landscape in the prisons and you see that the overwhelming majority of people there are people of color. And what's telling you as well is that, you know, you look at how much it costs for them to keep a prisoner in prison. And the younger you are, the more the more it costs. It costs upwards of $200,000 per year to keep a juvenile, a, a quote unquote juvenile in the prison industrial complex. Mm -hmm. And you, you would think that they would benefit more Meaning systemically, we would benefit more by putting that money into the education system, putting that money into the arts, putting that money into the communities, as opposed to putting that money into the prison industrial complex. But what we find is that they, they place value on the fact that prisons are privatized and people can make money off of us mm -hmm. that way. They place value on the fact that we, if, we get, if we get trapped in the system at a younger age the harder it is for us to get out of that system, the more we are in the revolving door, which is recidivism, you know? And so this book is really about that story. It's about the journey of a young man, a young boy, who um, for all intents and purposes, when we look at 16 year olds, we see them as still children, right? Yeah. And so it's the story of the young child. It's the story of the family that is going through this unjust system with him. Um, it's the story of, gentrifying neighborhoods. It's the story of, you know, two criminal system of injustices, one where it's the criminal justice system, the other where it's the criminal system of injustice, where if you have blacker skin, you are, you have to prove your innocence. Mm -hmm. You know, in America, they say that you're innocent until proven guilty. But when you are a person of color, you are automatically seen as guilty having to prove yourself innocent. And it's a brilliant, beautiful book. It's a work of art. Um, visually stunning, feels good in your hands. It does. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, they say you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, but the good thing about this particular cover is that it is like the be most beautiful thing that I have ever seen um, that I have ever created with along with Ibby. And I tell you, you know, just I'm just happy for for um, people to be able to experience this with us. I think your your love and your passion and your excitement for it really shines through in just your words. So I'm I'm so happy that we're speaking to you about this. And you have written the book entirely in verse. What made you both decide to write the story in this kind of way? Well, Yusef already, when I ran into him a few years ago, he was uh, selling his self-published book of poetry. 
And I just didn't think it was fair that he was, you know, he was self publishing when he has such an important story to share with young people. And we, and I was already published with a major publisher, HarperCollins. And we just came together and was like, you need to share this story with young people. And the foundation for how the story was going to be told was already in some of the poems. Now he wrote uh, most of the poems while he was incarcerated. And I kind of built the story around a few of those poems. One of them is most memorable is uh, a poem called I Stand Accused. It didn't make it into the book, but it served as a foundation for the character Amal, um, what kind of boy he is, his worldview, his outlook. This is a very spiritual boy who's very aware, socially aware of what is happening and why it's happening to him. And that character came from Youssef's poems. I just found it fascinating to be 16 and 17 and to be able to articulate injustice mm -hmm. while injustice is happening to you. Yeah. So, and we both come like, come from New York City where there's a strong, uh, well, hip hop started in New York City mm -hmm. and we are from this uh, world of conscious hip hop mm -hmm. where uh, hip hop was making political statements um, when we were growing up and there was a message in the music. So basically we're pulling from uh, hip hop, um, both me and Youssef's loves of poetry, rhythm, rhyme, and getting to the raw emotion of a boy who's caught between a proverbial rock and a hard place. It all sounds lovely to draw from parts of both of you. So whether it be the poetry, the music, the arts, whatever it is, and to bring it all into one book. And I know that uh, the characters' base experiences are based on some of yours, Yusuf, and you've taken from your experiences being incarcerated. Was there any Body else or any any other story that you've taken from and kind of built into to develop the character for your book? Yes, absolutely. It was it was a collective, I, I would say, experience of uh, folks that we had both heard about that we may have personally um, experienced throughout our lives. You know, there was the Yusuf Hawkins back in 1990. You know, there's the Trayvon Martin, of course. There's you know Kamani Kamani Gray. You know, Tamir Rice, um, Breonna Taylor, you know, both men, both boys and girls, men and women, um, young people, um, the full gamut. And what was brilliant about this was that we didn't have to necessarily just rely on my story because we could really tap into those experiences that we had both seen and heard of, you know, Amadou Diallo, you know, I mean, there was so many, so many things to, to pull from. And then you had it on both sides because America paints the picture of the haves and the have nots, you mm -hmm. know, where you have the Bernard Getz of the world who says, well, I'm going to be the vigilante and take matters into my own hands. And back in 1989 ends up, uh, I think it was 1989 or 1990. Yeah. Um, yeah shoots, shoots individuals uh, who he feels uh, are robbing him or about to rob him, you know? Um, and so you look at those things, and you realize that there's a wealth of experience that we can share. And our attempt at punching the air is to share that, is to really be able to tap into those multifacets of life that in a way share the same, um, not necessarily outcome, but are on the same path of injustice, you know, and how we also can right that wrong, right? And so this is not just about injustice, but this is also about having the opportunity to pull up a chair at the table to have that conversation to begin mm -hmm. to look at systemic change especially where we are now when the whole world is crying out for black life to matter you know we're talking about how do we have that conversation locally um and also um nationally and internationally with books like punching the air you know and so it gives us that opportunity to really dive in yeah, and really yeah. um, share too, because the other thing I think that happens when young people read books like this is that it, the, you know, punching the air becomes the water for the seed that is already inside of them. Mm -hmm. That seed that is supposed to be strong through the nurturing and through the support of community and gives that child the opportunity to say, I matter. 
And you know what? I'm going to be the one that's going to break things. I'm going to be the one that's going to unify us. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be the one amongst the many that will be um, a person who adds to the greater good as opposed to detracting from it. Yeah, for sure. I feel like now is a time and especially the last six months or so or maybe even a year that you know the black lives matter movement is becoming you know full force and and, and everyone's having discussions and conversations about how we can make change and how we can move forward and what and what we are kind of doing and i think especially in the uk when the netflix series uh, now they see us that that was like a massive a massive moment for us in the uk because that was a a lot of people's first time hearing about these unrated five. That was the first time a lot of people in the UK even knowing anything like that even happened. So I think from then, we've started to realise in the UK, things are happening in America and it's making us look at our own country in a different light as well. And I know that the series uh, was massive in the UK. And I, and I guess for you, it must have kind of, made your story bigger on a on a on a global scale on an international scale how has the response been for you yes you said since that since that's come out wow there's been so much outpouring of love so much support you know one of the things i think about when i you know connect with the reality that people don't know our story mm -hmm. it, it reminds me of a statement that dr angela davis said that we as a people have historical amnesia and she said we meaning the totality of us as global people have historical amnesia. And she wasn't necessarily, I believe she wasn't necessarily talking about something that we've chosen, but rather she was talking about the fact that the way we've been socialized, you know, I've been on stage talking about the Central Park Jagger case or the Central Park Five as we were once known and now the Exonerated Five. And I remember, I never forget this, I came in front of a, a group of middle schoolers and they said to me, oh wow, you're part of a music group? You know, we're talking about 31 years later today, or this mm -hmm. year, it's 31 years later, and people have been done a disservice, really, by disconnecting of the tragedies of what happens in the criminal justice system. What is a part of America? What is a part of the civil rights movements? What is a part of the human rights movements, right? They want us to believe that things are okay. And the reality of the matter is that things are not okay and they've not been okay for a long time. And the way that they have uh, trained us to believe, it is almost as if the education of the Negro is purposefully to make sure that we don't connect the dots. Mm -hmm. And so therefore we become the miseducation of the Negro, you know? And in that reality, by not connecting the dots, we then see these examples of mistreatment, these examples of oppression. And we say, oh, that, that that is an anomaly. Though that's not the norm. That's not how the world is. But as you said, as we can all see, our stories aren't being told, mm -hmm. right? But our stories are happening. You know, and they're happening in a very, very um, wide way, and very oppressive way. Mm -hmm. But they're telling us not to say anything. Mm -hmm. You know, they're telling us, hey, you know, it's okay. You can protest, but don't organize. Yeah. Because once we organize, once we unify, then we can say we can, as our professor said, you know, remember, Ani, she told us in a class once, she said, if we decided that the system of oppression, the system of white supremacy, white male dominance is over, if we decide it, then it will be over tomorrow. Yeah, that's how powerful it is. It just it just takes it takes uh, a, a moment or a time for us to decide. Um, Ibi, do you, do you, for people listening right now to Happy to Extra, we are a music station. We're a breakfast show. We play a lot of music and, and, and sometimes people like, like to be, you know, to go about their day and be a little bit ignorant as to what's going on or what's happening around them. Is there anything that you can suggest um, to people listening that they can do themselves to kind of help with the cause that we're all pushing so heavily right now? So earlier you had asked what uh, Punching the Air is about, and I'm not sure we really got into the heart of what the story is about. It does include racism. It does include conversations about mass incarceration and juvenile uh, justice, but at its core, and I think what the most important thing is, 
It's about a boy contending with himself. He has nowhere to go. He is incarcerated. Mm -hmm. um, so he has to figure out how he makes it through to the next day. And there is no megaphone in um, prison. Well, he's just getting there. He can't get into get out on a bullhorn and just speak his truth, right? He's not rhyming just yet. He doesn't have a microphone, but he's pretending to be because he has so much to say. But that that process takes time. I think the most important thing to tell young people now is to, it's okay that not everybody is the town crier. And I think everybody feels the need to get on something and say something, but I really think there is power in sitting back, reflecting, and then making your art quietly. Mm -hmm. The thing about this book is that when we first met in 1999, we could have written this book if we had the means. We were young, but let's say we decided to tell his story even while he wasn't incarcerated. It still would have been relevant in 1999. Um, I had to get to a place where I worked on my writing skills. I built my career to the point where I was already a published author. So by the time I meet Youssef again, I had already worked on my skills for us to collaborate in this way. So in that sense, I could have, you know, I was very loud and very vocal in college, but I spent years working on my craft so that when I do have something to say, there's quality to it it's more, it resonates even more. Mm -hmm. So I know that there are people who want to rhyme when they're listening to the music. They want to make their own music. They want to get into whatever field they want to get to and speak out against injustice. But it's also good to be quiet for a moment and really think about what you have to contribute to the world. So yeah. this is a book about an artist who has to like, okay, what is it that I have to say and what tools do I need? before I say it. And by the time I say what it is um, I'm ready to say, it's going to be profound. I think I think what you said is really beautiful, especially at a time that we live in right now where everyone has a platform to say whatever they want 24 seven all the time. And sometimes it's good to just take a step back, really have a think, educate yourself a little bit more if that's what you need to do. And then like you said, when you do something to say, it's profound. It makes sense. It's gonna, it's gonna hit exactly where it needs to hit. So I think that's a good thing that we can take away from the book, from the, from the character. And finally, from both of you, if you could sum up why people should read Punch in the Air, what would you say? We said it like, you know, bits and bobs in our chat, like in the last five or so minutes, but a quick little summary. <laughs> no pressure <laughs> so, so I, you know I, I come from sometimes just an old school philosophical perspective and one of the things that's screaming out in my head right now is how successful we are when we read right when I was in prison one of the things that the old timers would say to me all the time is um, one who reads will always succeed because there's not too much that they don't know mm -hmm. you know punching the air is Brilliant, valuable water for the seed inside of all of us. And for us to be able to tap into even the wording, right? The name Amal means hope. And they placed hope in prison. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is that he had to be able to get a, a hold of himself and come into, grow into who he is in order to become the hope for his own self. He had to be the change that he saw, mm -hmm. right? And so punching the air, I believe, is about being purposeful in life, knowing that you were born on purpose and with a purpose. And then once you realize that, you can then rise to the challenge of the why, right? Because the why is the, is the, is the question that we all have. Why me, right? I said that when I was going through the prison industrial complex, and then I realized that I was actually growing through the prison industrial complex. So it was more than just a why, but me knowing the why, me knowing the answer to the why was me being able to live. Yeah. Right? And I think that that's really what it's about. Beautiful words, thank you. And it be from yourself. So this book is about art, um, first and foremost, and the process that it takes to make art. 
Uh, Amal is an artist and someone calls him young Basquiat. Um, what happened, what do you do with rage, right? So for young people who are angry right now and confused and really want to say something, this is a book that you could pause, read the words, and it's not dense because it's all poetry and verse. Let it seep into your soul. And I really think you'll get something out of it in terms of how do I say what, I, what it is that I want to say? How do I get through and get past these walls that are around me? And while Amal is incarcerated, of course, a young, you don't need to have been to prison or be incarcerated or been in a violent incident to, re to really connect with Amal. I think anybody can have personal walls around them, the wall that, that they built around them, these imaginary walls. How do you break down those walls to speak your truth? So in this moment now, I think it is just a very important book because there's so much confusion, confusion, a pandemic, a revolution in the streets, lots of uncertainty. Just imagine being a boy where, they're li where his life is completely upended because of one night. How mm -hmm. does he make it through? Mm -hmm. I think I think it sounds like lovely like lessons to learn from and to grow from. So I want to thank you guys so much for joining me on the show today. I am a massive bookworm myself, so I'm really excited to, to like chat about it with my mates and everything. And I think Leah, who is in here somewhere, she's chatting to you next. She's also from the book club for Capital Extra. So you're going to be chatting to her a little bit more.